This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television. Your support makes UCTV's programming possible. Contribute online at uctv.tv slash support. Check out the YouTube original channel UCTV Prime at youtube.com slash UCTV Prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. For those of you who don't know, I'm Mike Kalichman. I'm a professor at UC San Diego and director for the Center for Ethics and Science and Technology. Uh, what we are um, going to see tonight is the eighth of nine programs in the series on the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks. Each of our programs has taken a different perspective, a different tack of some issue or issues that come out of that book that help inform are thinking about what makes for good research, what makes for good clinical trials and studies in humans. And many of those topics very much um, intersected with the questions of science and technology on the one side and where the ethical challenges are on the other side. Our goal has been to try and bring those topics together in a way that the members of the general public, and, and you really represent a very general public um, by being here tonight, um, can speak with people often from different academic disciplines, identify where those issues are, look for solutions, and hopefully we all learn from that collective wisdom. Tonight's program is going to look at a different slice of that story. Those of you who have read the book, and actually I should ask, how many of you have read The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks? So that's always nice to see. A high percentage of people have read the book, um, which you don't always see in classes you teach at the university. Um, so, Having, so you, you, might, you will recall that religion was an important part of the lives of Henrietta Lacks and her family members. And in many ways, religious issues are very important to how we deal with science and technology in this country from a public policy perspective and often certainly from a personal perspective. With that in mind, um, we put together this panel this evening, which will have a, give us a chance to think about some of the issues that um, are important in this Henrietta Lacks story that um, religious perspectives might um, give us some insight into. To moderate this panel, Mark Mann of Point Loma Nazarene University will be our moderator this evening. Mark is a professor of theology and a director of the Wesleyan Center for Interdisciplinary Studies at Point Loma Nazarene. And I know personally from having interacted with Mark now for some time that he's particularly interested in trying to bridge that gap between what is a question of personal belief and theological perspective with the scientific perspective. And tonight will hopefully help exemplify that. So I want to welcome Mark to the podium, and he will take over from here. Thank you, Michael, and, and thank you all for uh, coming tonight. This is a, uh, I, what I hope will be a really uh, engaging conversation. As uh, Michael indicated, uh, religion is both, um, in fact, a significant part of the uh, conversation um, for uh, much that deals with public policy in our country. And certainly, Henry L. Lacks, if nothing else, raises a lot of public policy type of issues, as, as well expl as explicitly religious ones. And uh, so we thought it was very important to, uh, to try to look at this story and its issues from this particular perspective as a way of, of, of uh, coming to a deeper understanding of that. It, it also is, uh, I would argue, um, something we should be thinking about and uh, talking about. Uh, because our, our culture is, and our, our country is, by definition, a secular one. And uh, I think it, uh, often a shallow understanding of secular means non-religious. But a, a deeper and richer understanding of secular means that there is no particular viewpoint that should shape all of our discourse. And in fact, that means that a lot of different uh, perspectives and, um, and uh, biases and viewpoints should be brought to the table 
in discussing who we are and, and how we should proceed with um, public policy and how we live together as a society. And therefore, that means that a secular society should include religious voices. And that's what we have tonight. Uh, we have uh, not just people who know something about religion, but people who are themselves deeply religious people as well, people who represent the traditions um, from which and about which they're going to speak tonight. Um, and so I want to introduce them, bring them up, and then I'm just going to turn it over to them to, uh, to give some initial um, statements. First of all, we have uh, from, the, uh, from San Diego State University, we have uh, Khalil Mohammed, who is an associate professor of religion and a core faculty member in San Diego State's Center for Islamic and Arabic Studies. Welcome, uh, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, next, we have uh, from uh, University of San Diego, Lexi, Lexi, uh, Lexi sorry, uh, Tsomo, who is an associate professor of theology and religious studies and is uh, both a practicing and expert on Buddhism. And if it wasn't already uh, obvious by his name, uh, Dr. Muhammad is, uh, is both a Muslim and a, um, a scholar of uh, Sharia law. Uh, and finally, we have uh, also from Point Loma Nazarene University, uh, Michael Lodal, who is the professor of theology and world religions and a good colleague of mine, and also practicing and uh, a scholar of Christianity. So I've asked each of our guests uh, to uh, talk about their own particular traditions viewpoint of, of uh, death and the afterlife. The uh, name of the book, as you all know, is The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Uh, just in the title itself is a, uh, what uh, many would call a deeply spiritual or religious uh, piece of information. There is in some sense that Henrietta Lacks is immortal. Uh, there are a lot of different ways of thinking about that and what it might mean. Uh, Deborah Lacks, the, the daughter of Henrietta Lacks, has an encounter with her, her cousin Gary. And um, in this, Gary, who's also a Pentecostal um, pastor, talks about um, Henrietta Lacks not just being immortal in terms of her cells living on forever, but there being a deeper sense in which uh, she is immortal. Um, and uh, in some sense, this has to do uh, with his own religious faith and, and um, religious understanding. So um, I've asked each of, uh, each of our, again, our, our uh, panelists to talk about um, their own particular religious traditions view of life and immortality and the afterlife in relationship to um, in relationship to this book, and then we'll we'll dig deeper into things as we open things up to um, to discussion with the uh, the audience tonight. So, uh, Dr. Muhammad, would you go first? You had a call on the guy with a broken shoulder, man. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's a he told me it's a it's a cricket injury. <laughs> We're supposed to speak on three aspects to begin with, which is the life, afterlife, and death. Um, from the life point of view, within Islamic law, when I first read the book, as a person of color, I must admit, the first thing that screamed out at me was how much Henrietta was wronged. And then I started thinking of what was projected in the book about her right as a human being and property rights, etc. And the emotional side of me took over to say, well, th these are her cells, and so much is owed to Henrietta and her family in terms of remuneration. But then after the emotional side got over, I started look at, uh, looking at it from the point of view of Islamic law. And in Islamic law, which despite what you might hear in the press, there's no one interpretation of Islamic law. There are several discourses and several controversies. And when it comes in modern Islamic law, as far as tissue and cell donation, etc., goes, the same controversy that plays out in American law plays out in Islam. How so? Well, because the question is, who owns one's body? Is it God that owns your body and you're just a custodian of that body or not? The body is almost like in Islamic law, this, we can make an analogy between it and water. Water, because in the desert, water is an absolute necessity. And even in Islamic law, one might own the private rights to water. He or she must allow that water to be used, even free of cost, to those who cannot afford it, so that others might survive. 
in the case of the body, the argument is that the state is commissioned to do what is best for its citizens. And if one knows that the sample is being given, etc., and it is used for medical research, then insofar as it benefits the entire community, that is your duty as a human being. You are entitled to be told once again what is being done to you. No, nobody can do anything without your express knowledge. So in this way, from an Islamic point of view, Henrietta Lacks was wronged. The use of her cells for later medical research, that is a position of controversy which I guess we'll approach later. As far as Gary talking about, and there was some superstition now I'm getting into the afterlife aspect of it, where uh, Deborah, for example, talks about certain things that happened. And in her aspect, well, Henrietta was still living in some way and she could cause things to happen. From an Islamic point of view, generally this is frowned upon. It's not accepted. You're dead, you're dead. There is some discourse, there's some discourse about the possibility of communication between the dead and the dead. My mom recently died. I don't know what she's telling my dad. But um, <laughs> between the dead and the living, we don't have this aspect as far as normative Islamic law is concerned. Certain cultural practices within Islam, such as probably in Pakistan or in India, you might find people talking about communicating with the dead, but the idea that the dead can cause calamities to happen based on them being wrong is um, not part of normative Islam. Now the aspect comes up to which is a bit, again, another controversy in Islam when someone dies. I'm trying to stay away from the martyrdom discourse because that's a whole other ball game. Some of you might start feeling uncomfortable. Uh, the way that Henrietta died might be considered by many as having died as a martyr. A person dies in childbirth or certain duties, it is considered the death of a martyr. And in Islam, there is this discourse that is very mystical that say, there's a verse in the Quran that says, do not say of those who die in the way of God that they are dead. Rather, they are alive and you know not how. They are being nourished with God. There's the theory that this comes from a discourse within the Hebrew Bible, but I'm not gonna go there. As far as many are concerned then, Henrietta Lacks with the discussion of her immortality over and above that which is in books attributed to her cells, from a religious point of view, some may consider her as being specially blessed and uh, living the life of a martyr that with God can only be rewarded in a way known to the divine. That's my time for my allotted eight minutes, so. <laughs> Lekshe, pass on to you. Okay, Dr. Somo, would you uh, comment next, please? Um, good evening. Um, looking at it from a Buddhist point of view, we have to completely change our frame of reference. Um, I think of it as just coming from a totally different point of view. We think in terms of rebirth, that we don't just live one time, but we live again and again and again and again until we get it right. <laughs> and so there is nothing immortal in Buddhism. Change is one of the primary teachings of the Buddha. Uh, he taught that death is inevitable for all of us. It's, and when death will come is uncertain. We, no one knows for sure. So, but we do know that we're all going to die, right? That, that, there's no question about that. Uh, but the time of death is unknown. And where we will be reborn next is also unknown to us, um, to anyone, actually. And it depends upon our actions, how we live our lives. So whether we live our lives with uh, moral virtue and compassion and generosity and so forth, or not. So our future depends on our actions in this life. So I think that some of these um, the teachings are applicable here. For one thing, humans are not the only people alive. Of course, we know about the animals, but in the Buddhist perspective, there are also many other beings 
uh, seen and unseen. And these also can factor in. So talking to the dead is questionable, but the idea that <coughs> those who have died are somewhere in some form of rebirth is entirely possible from a Buddhist perspective. Um, Normally, they don't talk about talking to the dead because talking to your, say, your deceased mother or father wouldn't make sense in a way in that they will have taken a completely different form than the form in which we remember them. So the memory lives on with us, with the living, but it doesn't represent what the person looks like now. So it brings up all kinds of identity issues and how we are identified in our cells and our DNA and all of that, well, the Buddhists have no idea. Because at the time of the Buddha, we didn't have these technologies. So we have no sort of sayings of the Buddha about these very complex issues. The principles that guide Buddhists are um, not to kill, not to steal, not to lie, um, not to run around with other people's partners and so forth. And so these principles, the first three, really do apply, I think, in this case, in certain ways. Um, <clears throat> whether the death of a cell would be considered um, non-virtuous or unwholesome is another question. But the idea of withholding medical care or the knowledge that would help one to live a full life is definitely applicable here. Uh, lying, stealing. If you take someone's cells without them knowing, well, um, we'd have to question that. But there's so many question marks that this book raises that are so important. And of course, the overriding virtue of compassion and loving kindness. <laughs> Obviously, what, what the family went through, was it, it wasn't handled compassionately. And there were compassionate people there, but they Many of them did not deal with the situation compassionately, especially when financial gain gets in the picture or even professional advancement. Mm -hmm. Then things can go real wrong real fast. So um, from a Buddhist perspective, we always want to try to view issues from a perspective of loving kindness and compassion and wisdom, uh, which, of course, means many things to many people. So. OK, thank you. Professor Lodl? So we were given eight minutes, and I don't trust myself any other way than with a script, because I'm a preacher. I'd go on and on. Um, I worked basically with the sort of topic question, um, is Henrietta Lacks really immortal? But to the question, is Henrietta Lacks really immortal, the simplest, most straightforward reply the Christian tradition offers is no. This may sound counterintuitive to some, surprising to others, and just downright wrong to at least a few. But I begin by appealing to a passage of the Christian scriptures in the document called 1 Timothy, in which we read that God, who gives life to all things, alone has immortality and dwells in unapproachable light. The word immortal means incapable of dying. While the scriptures teach that God is the source and giver of life to all that lives, the life they receive as God's creatures, and this most assuredly includes creatures who are humans, is mortal life, temporary, radically dependent, contingent, fleeting, and vulnerable. The Bible utilizes imagery like grass that is here today and gone tomorrow, or dust that is subject to the blowing of the winds to describe or characterize creaturely existence. Thus it is God the Creator who alone may be described by the adjective immortal, while all creaturely existence inevitably fades away, utterly incapable of approximating this one who dwells in unapproachable light. I must hasten to admit, however, that Christian tradition has been rather stubborn in its enduring insistence upon the idea that each human being has, or even most essentially is, an immortal soul. In this common and popular understanding of the human, when the body dies, the soul lives on. Thus, the answer to our question regarding Henrietta Lacks has not been so readily or so simply answered. So quite aside from the question as to whether Henrietta can be considered immortal due to her seemingly indestructible cell line, excuse me, cell line, several times in the book, it is clear, as has been mentioned, that various family members assume that Henrietta is alive as a spiritual being. And not only alive, uh, Khalil mentioned this, but considerably more powerful in her present state. 
So the ability that she can wreak havoc on things, and I, especially the, uh, the, the account of her funeral, you might remember a uh, great storm of, of wind and rain that hit the area, even killed one of her own cousins. Uh, so that a surviving cousin, Peter, recalled, Henrietta never was what you'd call a beaten around the bush woman. We should, <laughs> we should have known she was trying to tell us something with that storm. So the author, Rebecca Sklutes, in fact, mentions in the prologue how often Deborah alludes to, again, uh, her mother sort of, uh, you know, messing with stuff. Uh, and even, even a, a, a one of Rebecca's agents falls to an accident, and Deborah is sure this is uh, Henrietta's doing. So while Sklutes writes in the prologue that Deborah believed Henrietta's spirit lived on in her cells, controlling the life of anyone who crossed its path, it certainly is clear that Deborah did not associate her mother's immortality just with those robust cells. Near the book's end, you might remember when Deborah's own death is imminent. Sklutz writes, Deborah said she was glad that when she died, she wouldn't have to tell her mother the story of everything that happened with the cells and the family because Henrietta already knew. She's been watching us and seeing all that's going on down here, Deborah said. She's waiting patiently for us. There won't be any words, just a lot of hugging and crying. I really believe she's up in heaven and she's doing okay because she did enough suffering for everyone down here. On the other side, they say there's no pain or suffering. I want to be there with my mother. The book's most dramatic discussion of these issues occurs in chapters 36, aptly titled Heavenly Bodies. Uh, Mark alluded to this briefly. It's a conversation between Sklutz and Deborah's cousin Gary sparked by Gary's gift of a Bible to the author. I want you to have this, he told me, tapping the cover with his finger. He died for us that we might have the right to eternal life. A lot of people don't believe that, but you can have eternal life. Just look at Henrietta. That's Gary's words. It really is no coincidence that most of the ensuing conversation centers around a passage from one of the letters of the Apostle Paul, his first letter to the church in Corinth. This passage, 1 Corinthians 15, is undoubtedly the single most important New Testament treatment of the questions of immortality and the resurrection of the body. Sklutz recalls that uh, what Gary read from that chapter, someone will ask, this is Paul writing, someone will ask, how can the dead be raised to life? What kind of body will they have? You fool. I always felt like Paul sort of cheated there. You know, just, you can't just call people names, you know, <laughs> and end the argument. You fool, when you plant a seed in the ground, it does not sprout to life unless it dies. And what you plant is a bare seed, not the full-bodied plant that will later grow up. God provides that seed with the body that He wishes. God gives each seed its own proper body. Now, here's the important point. Paul, in this letter, is addressing the doubts of some of his Corinthian Christian converts regarding the resurrection of the body whether this is feasible, what kind of body do they come with. Um, the debate is not about whether human beings have or are immortal souls. This is important. But whether it makes any sense to expect God to resurrect bodies. That is why Paul could anticipate this most basic question that at least some Corinthians were asking. How can the dead be raised to life? What kind of body will they have? Uh, the similar questions are fielded by Muhammad, you know, and recorded in the Quran and other, uh, other uh, texts as well. Those Corinthians had doubts about all this because they knew what was happening to the corpses of their loved ones buried in the catacombs, and it was not pretty. It was more like something out of Michael Jackson's thriller or the latest zombie movie, and I guess there's really no difference between those, anyway. <laughs> Thus, as beautiful in a way as Gary's interpretation is of Henrietta's glorified heavenly body as these hardy cells, that Hela is her spiritual body, page 296, it really misses the point of Paul's teaching and thus of Christian teaching. Paul's model of the resurrection is God's raising of Jesus from death, raising him as what Paul calls a spiritual body. But this is not an immortal soul that automatically survives bodily death, nor can it be reduced or trivialized into an unimaginably huge mass of cells, as in fact Hela is today. Paul wrote to those early believers, wavering, if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. 
Again, Christ's resurrection is the first fruits and the model of the Christian hope for life beyond the horizons of death. Thus, this hope is not in the evidence of Henrietta's robust cell line, nor, for that matter, in the notion of an immortal soul. For as Paul continues in his argument, if the dead are not raised by God, then let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. That is to say, apart from the resurrecting, life-bestowing power of God our Creator and Recreator, when we die, we're dead, and that is that. Henrietta lacks immortality, but according to the promises of Scripture, her perishable body shall, in the age to come, put on imperishability, and her mortal body shall put on immortality. And then, writes Paul, uh, that saying that is written will be fulfilled, that death has been swallowed up in victory. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Michael. So let's dive a little uh, more into the controversy. I'm going to ask you uh, one question I'd like you each to address, and first um, Michael, then, um, then Lexi, and then uh, Khalil, okay? Um, and it's the same question for all of you. Um, under what conditions is it okay then to use a person's cells in the way that um, I think if each of you have given a, a kind of a preview into what your answer is, but I'd like you to just explore in a minute or two more deeply uh, what are the conditions under which a person's uh, cells after they have died are okay to be treated in the way that um, um, Henrietta Lacks cells were treated? Michael, you want to start? Well, I certainly agree with Khalil's earlier comment that um, uh, I love the idea that the body, in a sense, isn't simply my own, and, and thus, if um, in love for the neighbor, uh, what I might think of as my resources can be uh, shared with others for their benefit, that's wonderful. I also agree that the idea of consent and information is extremely important here, but, but I would want to underscore the notion that, that really, we, it, I think a Christian valuation of this is our bodies are not our own. And uh, what we're most fundamentally called to is love for the neighbor. And, um, and that would include neighbors who live after we do. So um, beyond the issues, or certainly in, in, in remembering the issues of information, consent, and then the question, of course, of, of who benefits, and I know that other sessions have addressed this, but who, who really benefits from this, and, and how do we make this uh, uh, not simply a matter of a love for certain neighbors, but there is this kind of justice uh, in, in the way that uh, these benefits are shared is a very important issue as well. Okay, Lakshmi? Well, from a Buddhist perspective, our bodies are our own. Um, whose else, I mean, they wouldn't belong to someone else, but they are impermanent. They are perishable. Um, the body is only one of five um, components of the body, of the person. We have the body and the feelings, the recognitions, the karmic dispositions, and the consciousness. So all of these things together uh, make up a person. Uh, and the idea is that we don't take away from other people what is not ours. That's the definition of stealing, is taking what is not given. So in this case, if um, science needs cells to work on, then it would, from a Buddhist point of view, be best for them to ask the person's consent and informed consent. Um, the book says, I think, uh, again and again, it says or implies that the family was not fully up to speed on all of the science. How many of us are? And what does it mean to sign a waiver? And, um, you know, are we in our right minds and fully informed when we sign such a waiver? So I think that on one hand, the compassionate thing would be to donate ourselves for the good of humanity, uh, for this and future generations. That's obviously uh, a good thing to do, generosity, compassion, and so forth. But it should be with a person's um, consent. And, and full knowledge of what it means to donate your cells. Even you might think that you're going to donate your cell, but then what are the consequences of that? Exactly what are they going to be used for? And will they be shown respect? And, um, well, there are a lot of questions yet to be asked and debated. You did say after death, right? Yes. Okay. I'm originally from the Caribbean. And the reason why I tell you that is because I am also, as you told, I'm a Muslim. I tell you I'm from the Caribbean because you have me, myself, and I, 
to discuss the subject, which means there's different <laughs> viewpoints about it. In the Quran, there is a verse that says, you will never attain righteousness until you give of that which you truly love. And some people interpret it to mean property, and some modern interpretations have it to do with even organ donation. You will never attain true piety unless you give of that which you truly love. And I already told you that in the Islamic state, in the theoretical Islamic state, it is supposed to look after the benefit of its citizens, and that includes medical research too. And so from this viewpoint, one says, well, that when I die, I should leave that which can be benefited from, and any part of me that can be of benefit to the community, it is the state's right to use it. There is also Muslim tradition that follows that, that says, when a human dies, everything dies with him, except three things. And since my mother is dead, <laughs> we won't go there with the last part of it. It says, an ongoing charity, knowledge that is benefited from. And lastly, and this is where my mom comes in, it says, a righteous child. <laughs> 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 That it's, a makes, it's a hopeful statement. <laughs> <laughs> that makes supplication for the, page, for, for the deceased. But the part I want to focus on is a, an ongoing charity or knowledge that is benefited from. In both cases, these would seem to apply to body tissue that can be used for medical research. So that's my answer to your question. In the Islamic tradition, it would be deemed all right and good to do it. Very good. Well, I think we've, uh, we've got half a dozen different um, Pandora's boxes that have been uh, opened up here. Let's, uh, let's dive more deeply into, uh, into some of them. Anybody have comments or questions? We have a microphone over here. Since our bodies are really composed of not only cells, but those cells operating together in an energy field, when a cell by itself is removed from that energy field, is it still a part of the body? And who are you asking? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not a good one? I think that would be a good one for you. <laughs> yeah, I know how many left. No, I have no idea, really, <laughs> how to answer that. Um, as far as the energy fields, I mean, Energy fields, I, the Buddhists don't have anything to say about that, in a way. Because this, this research is quite new. These ideas of the, the Japanese fellow who t found that the water was, uh, did these um, pictures mm. yeah, of the water that's affected by our emotions <coughs> and our thoughts. Uh, I think the Buddhists would agree that thoughts also create karma. We create karma through our bodies, our speech, and our mind. So there is a kind of an energy, but that energy, in order to create karma, has to be coupled with volition. So cells that are taken without our knowledge or without our permission, this is unknown exactly what's the parameter there. Um, not certain, but, um, but I do think, like I was a, pioneer, a polio pioneer, for example. In 1954, they came around to Sally B. Rutherford School, and we were all going to make the world safe from polio, right? We had no idea what was in those sugar cubes, and neither did our parents, right? We were effectively guinea pigs. And so, I mean, from personal experience, I mean, we were kind of proud to have a little pin and so on, but we didn't know what that meant, uh, where, where people were going with that. So. Um, the Buddhists talk more in terms of consciousness and awareness rather than energy fields, per se. But we could be wrong. <laughs> well, this is exceptional. You actually have something in common with Henrietta Lacks, then. I mean, each of your bodies, in a sense, were a part of the discovery of a polio vaccine. So we have a beautiful connection tonight. Yeah. I'd like to sort of address that a little bit. I, I wouldn't think in terms of energy fields either, but I, I don't know much about energy fields. 
but I would think about those cells in relationship to the other cells, uh, the very complex interrelationship of cells in a body so that when cells are extracted from that very complex, you know, deeply layered thing that a human is, then yeah, it's not really, I don't think it's the person anymore. And, and that's kind of where I'd think about with Henrietta Lacks in this cell line. Um, uh, the notion that that's somehow Henrietta still, apart from the brain cells and the, and the central nervous system and all that made Henrietta who she was. I, 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 in that regard, I think I share what I hear behind your question. If we think about DNA then, it sort of changes the perspective for me. And I'm speaking here as an absolute authority on the subject because I know nothing about it. <laughs> But it seems to me that because of the, the DNA part of it being so crucial is that even when the cell or cells are removed from the body, from a legal point of view, it may no longer be part of the body, which is what the American law seems to state, but because of what it carries in terms of medical research, et cetera, it will be attributed to you. So from an Islamic point of view, then it would have to do with contractual law getting into play here with permission, et cetera. I don't know if that answers, but you've certainly got us thinking now. Um, I'm going to try to phrase this as best I can, but um, I'm a physician, and I understand a little bit about the biology of the cells. First of all, um, there are different phases to live to life, um, and um, people die in, in, in parts. Um, you may die as an organism but your heart might, um, your blood might still be exchanging oxygen or so forth, then maybe your organs die and your cells die. So what we have left over from Henrietta <clears throat> in real terms in this world are her cells. So I would um, like to ask the question um, for each of the panelists, because all of your religious traditions date back several thousand years or more when I don't believe anyone understood what we understand about modern biology. And part of the challenge of this session is to sort of deal with science in conjunction with the religion. So the question is, how do your traditions deal with the notion of modern cellular biology? Um, and um, is there a way to, um, I don't want to say merge the two, but how do you oppose one to the other? Um, in terms of modern science and the traditions you represent. Could you say a little bit more specifically what particular, you said modern cell, cellular biology, could you say? Yeah, well, I, mean, um, I know Henrietta, that's a big topic. Hey, yeah, Henrietta's cells are alive because her DNA was altered because of a virus which wasn't even known in 1951 when this all happened. In fact, they misdiagnosed her because she didn't have squamous cancer, she had adenocancer and that was why her cells became immortal. Now we understand that HPV and other things can cause the immortality, which is in fact what Henrietta had was HPV. So um, her cells are alive because of a, of a um, chemical reaction and a biological reaction that's going on that causes them to continue to be able to divide and reproduce um, DNA to reproduce the cells that are there. So that's really what I mean by modern cellular biology. I'll try to go first. Um, this is one of the questions I love as an academic, but I hate answering in public. <laughs> Why do I, I hate answering it? Because we all can admit it honestly that my religion is under scrutiny right now like never before. And this sort of question leads to certain realities that exist in Islam which is to say right now, if we can take two broad stratifications or segmentations within the religion, there are those who wish to come to grasp with modernity, and there are those who wish to think that the Quran is a document for all time and place without it being changed or interpreted in any way other than which the traditional interpretations mean. Mm -hmm. And you might say, well, Judaism and Christianity are somewhat similar. No, it's not similar. Why so? Because if you ask my companion here for some exegesis in the Bible, the chances are he might quote from Paul, 
and he go through the centuries to somebody modern. If you ask a Jewish person that, and let's say it's a very old-fashioned Jewish person, he might come all the way down to Spinoza even. For me to establish my scholarship <coughs> in, a gath in a conservative gathering of my peers in my religion, I would have to be quoting, and the most famous exegete I can think about would be Tabari, who dies and let's say about 700 and something. Sorry, I'm giving you about 900. So this is how Muslims deal with this stuff. And those interpretations supposedly for many have oomph with the passage of time. There are modern Muslims who don't look upon it this way and see that all this is wrong and there are things within Islamic law that allow for it. For example, there's the concept of the change of law, what, for those of you here who are familiar with Islamic terminology, تغيير الأحكام لتغيير الأزمان. That is to say, laws change with the change of place. And then there's the place of time. Now we have science, as we understand it now, has totally changed our view of what went on in the past. So there are many Muslims who say, rightly so, that the Quran itself can contain nothing directly concerning this issue. So Muslim scholars, and there are the legal scholars among Islam, revisit something that is known in Islamic terminology again, al-maqasid al-sharia, which are to say the goals of the sharia. And this can be revisited. And now if the goals of sharia is to promote life, and the best way it is to be lived, then we have to take this in terms of modern science and what it comes up with. Again, the problem with this is that in a place like America, for example, where, and I must say thankfully so, our research into science is done as science. In places like Saudi Arabia and Iran, and now Iraq, a medical student in Saudi Arabia, for example, would have to spend several hours per week listening to lectures on what one calls creed or Quran. And the valuable time that he could spend, therefore, researching his field is colored, or I should say refracted, or even corrupted by what is taught to him as theology. And we have this playing out itself. I'm, I'm going to cut short here. Don't want yourselves to start destroying themselves. Um. <laughs> In England, just a few months ago, an imam who happens to be a scholar of biology, that was a very bad combination, <laughs> was lecturing at the mosque. And the Friday sermon, which is the most important sermon in the Muslim weekly calendar, and he happened to say, that evolution is what we must believe in if we are true observers of humanity. And the Muslim community arose, and many of them declared him a heretic. So this is what plays out in modern Islam. There are those who are very much for the scientific aspect and say that whatever the Quran, in the Quran that seems to go against it, we have to interpret it in a way that is against the literal interpretation, because if your religion goes against what is obvious, then something is wrong somewhere, and you have to make a choice. OK, now I give it back to you. <laughs> Nothing is permanent. <laughs> uh, well, in this case, we have, again, a different point of view. From the Buddhist point of view, we can question everything. In fact, we are mandated to question everything. And the Buddha said, don't believe anything that anyone tells you. Don't believe anything you read in a book. Don't believe anything I tell you until you have verified it through your own experience. So um, Buddhism is co completely compatible with scientific discoveries, including evolution. We can, we can match up you know, one way or another the Buddhist worldview and the scientific worldview. In fact, some, in some ways, they more or less uh, verify each other. But um, 
So that means that we could question everything that the Buddhist texts tell us. Uh, if the Buddhist text, there, there's one, I think it says the world is flat. It was written about the 6th century. And, and the Dalai Lama will tell you know, the Tibetan students, um, if you find out that the world's not flat, are you going to give up Buddhism? <laughs> uh, so he said that, uh, in fact, w w if modern science can prove certain things to be, to be true, like, for example, the time when life begins, Okay, traditionally in the Buddhist text, life begins at the moment of conception. But now if science says, well, actually, that life is not viable until the, whatever, the uh, fertilized ovum is embedded in the wall of the uterus, then, hey, we've got, you know, we've got some wiggle room there. So we'd have to look at, revisit the question, you see. Um, so I think that um, from a Buddhist point of view, we could, they're very, quite open to, to looking at these questions, which does not mean that they're going to, one thing that they don't really question is the law of cause and effect, karma, that actions have consequences. But I think that scientists also pretty much work on that same basic principle of cause and effect, if I'm not mistaken. But then it's been a long time since I took biology. <laughs> but, um, in fact, I took botany because they used to make you uh, cut up frogs. Yeah, and uh, you even had to kill a, your own frog. And um, I did botany. <laughs> I'll keep the answer short. I think I don't know where the person went. I'd like to be able to. Oh, hi. Um, Obviously, in Christianity, there's, there's certainly no unanimity on this kind of question, but my perspective would be essentially that you're, when we're talking about cellular, cellular biology or anything else in the sciences, we're, we're talking about the human attempt to understand the natural world. That's a good thing. Uh, you know, in theological categories, it's creation. Um, and, that, and with the assumption that human beings are in fact sort of commissioned to understand creation, to, to name it, to explore it. And um, I, so I, I think of the natural sciences as essentially one of the ways, uh, from a Christian point of view, that human beings really em embody the image of God. So uh, this, it's a very general answer, but um, I don't know anything about cellular biology, so it's gotta be pretty general. Certainly not one shared by all Christians, this view that you're espousing. No, right, right. I said no unanimity. Yeah. Uh, you know, Khalil was not, I mean, I think you might have it a little more extremely, but we certainly have our issues as well, of course. Yeah. Next, yeah. I, I'd like to follow up on both the last question, cell biology, and the previous question, the uniqueness of, of a single cell rather than an organism. And so if you can generate an organism from cell in a test tube, right, then it, it seems to me it takes away that field theory, because you can regenerate a whole organism from the cell in a test tube. Now, it's not going to be the same. It's going to be reincarnated. It doesn't have the same environmental influences that made it what it was. But nonetheless, it's hard to say that it's not a, a sentient being of some sort. Okay, And so this is a place, I think, where the cell biology and and the idea of immortality get to be really complicated uh, from a scientific perspective. I, I think, Khalil, you want to start with this? Because uh, it seems to me what we're talking about is a question of DNA, right? really, right? I mean, the information that makes us who we are is, to what extent does that information make us who we are? Is that the question? In a no, no, so the idea, DNA by itself doesn't do anything. DNA in a test tube doesn't do anything. You have to have that cell. Sure that can reproduce to, to regenerate this kind of organism. So I, my, my, I guess the question is, what does this do to the thinking about what immortality is? Because now you can't say, well, that cell is disassociated. So you know we don't have to worry about that the way we would an organism, a frog or a human or whatever else, because the cell has the ability to be the organism, right? Let me hit you with a question on that. So, so this is very similar to the abortion question, right? It's very similar to the question of, of when do you define life? Do you define it at, at the, a single cell stage? Do you define it at some later stage? 
right? Mm -hmm. So in this case, I, I think you have to think about cells in culture in that same kind of general concept. It's a lot harder to, to push them off into some, some area that you can say, well, you know, this is some kind of thing people mess around with in the, in the lab, because it has the potential. But my question before, if you don't mind, is to let us assume the cell that is being cloned, if I can use that layman's term. The cell that is cloned, or, or the donor cell, so to speak, is that, are you contending that it continues living or does it have to die? It will die at some point or we don't know. It could go into an organism. That organism can then continue to reproduce. Um, I get everything that's alive has the potential to be killed, right? <laughs> but uh, that, so, that's my, the question that colors my answer, because we're dealing with potential here, and as the previous person pointed out, the religion doesn't—at least the religion that I deal with, the Islam that I know—I'm sure there's some Muslims who disagree with me. My religion doesn't cover that sort of thing at this point in time, based on what we know. So it's an ethical, and and the answer that most. Jurists will give you that Islam as a religion deals with that which is more ethical. It talks in the Quran about race to do that which is good. That concerns that which is ethical rather than scientific. So the discourse would be, the answers to such a question would be colored by the Muslim understanding and the evolution of ethics as we go along. That's, I'm sorry, I can't offer anything better. From a, a Buddhist point of view, the potential for life um, is there in the Petri dish, but it won't become a sentient being until consciousness enters the, the mix. So, and it also runs a bit counter to the, to the Buddhist sort of um, generative myth of how we choose a next or how we, we take another rebirth that we are attracted by desire to, uh, well, a couple mating, actually. I know this sounds bizarre, but you know, imagine yourself dying, and then you're going to look for another rebirth. Well, it's going to be, right, where life begins. Um, and then you'll you're be attracted, or, I mean, we don't always choose, often according to our delusions and our karma then we would take another rebirth. But without a consciousness, it does not have the material in the Petri dish, even if it's a live culture, does not have the potential to become a human being or a sheep or, I mean, even a mouse. You know, in, at University of Hawaii, they cloned mice and they made them green color because that's our school color, the <laughs> University of Hawaii. So, um, so they have a bunch of green mice running around the lab now. Um, but whatever uh, the definition of a sentient being is one that has awareness or consciousness, and without that, it, it doesn't have that kind of potential. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think, actually, I, and I share a lot of that, that sort of answer. When I think of consciousness, and I'm not saying this is not necessarily like a standard Christian approach to this, but uh, consciousness, as I understand, is a function of again, a, a very complex relationships among cells, I mean, to put it simply, and I am a theologian, not a scientist. But in other words, having, having uh, uh, cells uh, being cloned in a Petri dish is a far cry from what it takes to create a self-aware being, whether it's a human or, or some other. So I'm, I'm, I guess I'm not too troubled by the scenario of the question, and it's certainly not immortal, because again, it's subject to death, and uh, you know, even Henrietta Lacks cell line. I mean, kind of the. I think the Christian perspective on this and the biblical would be, everything's mortal. My goodness, the universe is not immortal. At least not the one we know. Uh, someday the sun will burn out, or will you know something's going to happen, or we'll blow ourselves up. But uh, you know, every, every creature meets its end. That's part of what it means to be a creature, and that may be kind of taking it far from the question. So I'll stop there. Let's let you have the last word, which is applause for our great panel. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Mark, and our panelists. This was outstanding, and um, I want to say that I was particularly impressed with what we had happen here tonight, which was this tremendously thoughtful discussion, people with, I think, really widely divergent views about some issues, able to talk to one another, listen, and even though you may not always agree with one another, at least you can better understand some of the different positions. And although Mark didn't quite wrap it up, I'm going to take a, a risk of, of trying to jump in and say, what did we learn? And, I, and I, I think I was struck by at least one common theme that everybody was concerned with, this question of informed consent, that if somebody is going to give something of their body, even if it's cells that have been transformed by a cancer, that they should have some knowledge of what's going to happen with that and why and have a choice in that. And if, in, you know, at the time of Henrietta Lacks, everybody was uh, not given that right. It was just not commonly done, despite the fact that just a few years before that, the Nuremberg Code called for this principle of autonomy, that people have the right to self-determination. We are learning. Science is doing better now. That issue may not be solved, but um, we're much closer to that. The other issues are much newer. These questions that came up later tonight about stem cells, human embryonic stem cells are only one type. The question of identity is a much harder issue and one which um, scientists, policymakers, people of faith are going to have to wrestle with as we find that, the, that we can so easily manipulate and create and change what it means to be an individual for all of the reasons that you've, you've heard about tonight. So before you leave, um, I just want to note that this is the next to the last program in the series, the Henry Adelak series, next month's program. The ninth is, is defined as a capstone event. It has been organized by the Student Society for Medical Ethics at UCSD. Um, three members of that society are here tonight watching to see how things run. They are going to try and take a past, current, and future look at how we deal with the kinds of issues that were raised in the book. So I want to thank all of the audience and our speakers um, for an interesting program tonight. Thank you.